Stanford University. of the Mogadam program and the Bita Darya Bari Endowment, I would like to welcome you all to our ninth annual Bita Prize. I know Sharnusha Parsipur, the recipient of our award tonight, believes in what Jung has called synchronicity. She believes that the movement of heavenly stars might have an impact on our fate. Is it then mere coincidence that in the week of a historic election, when a woman was for the first time a candidate of a major party for presidency and more, won more votes than her counterpart, but sadly lost the election, and in the same week when the winning candidate was someone whose views on women were part of the campaign debate, we are giving the award to someone whose entire creative life has been dedicated to defending the rights of women and of advocating for a more pronounced presence of the feminine principle in our world. I know some might think it was a conspiracy, but as you know, we announced this award many, many uh, weeks ago. When you look back at the history of this award, it also offers many other fascinating links to this woman question. The award has been established and named after a woman, Bita Darya Bari. The first recipient of the award was Simine Behbahani, a poet who relentlessly advocated for women's rights and dignity. The second recipient was Guli Taraki, a woman writer of fiction and short stories in whose work women's lives is a constant theme. Muhammad Reza Shajarian was another recipient and he has been relentless in his insistence that women should be allowed to sing and perform music in Iran. Bahram Beizai is another one of our winners, and in his films and plays, women always occupy key roles. He made the first film after the revolution, called Bashu, where a woman was the chief protagonist. Mashid Amir Shahi, a talented novelist who again has been always interested on writing women's lives and writing about misogyny. And this year, of course, we have Shah Nusha Parsipur. In short, women have trumped everything else on the Beta Prize. Before I tell you a little bit about our recipient, let me introduce someone who's going to welcome you all on behalf of Stanford University. Dean Richard Saller, by training a professor of classics, is the Dean of the School of Humanities and Sciences here at Stanford. The Iranian Studies program is part of the School of Humanities and Sciences. The school itself is often described as the soul and core of the liberal education at Stanford University. 63% of all undergraduate degrees and 40% of all doctoral degrees given at Stanford are given in the more than 50 programs and departments 
that together comprise the School of Humanities and Sciences, and Dean Saller has been leading it capably for almost a decade. I will tell you a little bit about our program and its growth in the last 10 years, uh, and certainly the support of Hamid, Christina Mugaddam, and Pita Darya Bari have been essential, and your support have been as absolutely rewarding. But it is Dean Saller that, and his support for Iranian studies that has been the indispensable ingredient of our growth. Please join me in welcoming Dean Saller. Thank you, Abbas. Uh, it's really an honor to be here again this year to again participate in the Beta Prize presentation. Uh, I want to welcome all of you on behalf of Stanford University and to congratulate Ms. Parsipur uh, and, uh, for, for the award tonight and to thank Bita Dariabari for her generous sponsorship. The Iranian Studies program at Stanford fosters the interdisciplinary study of Iran as a civilization, one of the oldest in the world. Uh, its culture, history, literature, and society have long been the subject of scholarly interest, going back as far as Herodotus, uh, the person uh, I read as the father of history. As a modern nation, Iran is a pivotal country in shaping the future of the Middle East. This is also the 10th anniversary of the Iranian Studies program, and there's been much growth under Abbas Milani's leadership. Uh, he was very generous and kind in his introduction of me, but the truth is that without his leadership, the program would not be thriving in the way that it is today. It did require the vision and support of ha Hamid and Christina Mogadam, whose, whose generosity launched the program. And Bita Dariabari's generous support has allowed the program to expand in fields of literature and languages. One of my principal goals as dean at Stanford over the past decade has been to develop a more comprehensive program in international studies. It seems to me that if Stanford wishes to train the leaders of the future, it has to educate them in the cultures, peoples, religions of the world. Uh, in this effort of mine, the support of Bida and the Mogadams has been invaluable, and I, I'm very grateful for it. Let me offer you just a couple of illustrations of the activities of the program over the last year, the projects and the collections contributed to Stanford. Uh, Ambassador Ardashir Zahedi's papers are now in the Stanford Library. The 94 boxes of documents are an invaluable research archive on U.S.-Iran relations. Zahedi was twice Iran's ambassador to the U.S. in the early 1960s and 70s prior to the Iranian Revolution. The, pap the collected papers of Hushang Golshiri, uh, an acclaimed modernist writer, are now at the Green Library. Also, the films of Riza Alamezadeh will soon be at Stanford. This collection includes hundreds of hours of interviews with important political and artistic figures of modern Iran. The Stanford Festival of Iranian Arts recently staged a new play by Barem Bezai, uh, Iran's most acclaimed playwright. And last weekend, a three-day art conference took place at Stanford on art, social discourse, and public space in Iran. At no time is, has it been more important for the United States and American students and the American community to be exposed to programs about Iranian, the rich Iranian culture. The past winners of the Beta Prize have been luminaries in their fields from the first winner, the Grand Dame of Persian Poetry, to last year's winner, the editor-in-chief of Encyclopedia Iranica. So let me end by again offering my congratulations to Ms. Parsipur for her singular ac accomplishment and tenacity in her fight for artistic freedom and the equal rights of women, uh, a cause that we all endorse and support. So with that, I will ask Professor Milani to 
introduce her. Uh, let me uh, tell you a couple of uh, other facts about our program before I say a few uh, words about Shahnush uh, uh, Parsipur. Uh, as Dean Saller said, this is the 10th year, uh, aside from the Zahidi papers and the Golshiri papers, uh, which we are in the process of digitalizing, and hopefully very soon we will put it on online for access. Uh, and aside from the Allah uh archive, which is now here, it arrived just last week, uh, we also received literally this week uh, the letters uh, of Khan Baba Tehrani. Some of you might know Khan Baba Tehrani. He was one of the founding actors of the Iranian Confederation. In other words, someone who fought Zahidi for all of his adult life has decided to give all of his papers to us, as well as Ardashir Zahidi, as well as uh, Golshiri. Uh, and it is uh, the collection of all of these that I think will make, uh, has already made Stanford uh, the preeminent place for archival material on modern um, Iran. There are a couple of other uh, collections that might be coming our way, uh, and uh, hopefully next time I will tell you about them. Aside from the Festival of Iranian Arts that Dean, Dean Saller told you about, we have uh, two other initiatives that we have begun. Uh, Dean Saller has been a very uh, systematic and uh, forceful advocate for interdisciplinary studies at Stanford. Uh, and we have been engaging in a lot of this precise kind of interdisciplinary work. Uh, with the support of Hamid and Christina Mogaddam, we have launched a program called Iran Vision 2040. It is intended to study the Iranian economy uh, and offer white papers about the ways of solving the problem. We are launching a prize in economics. Uh, we're going to give a prize every year for the best economic paper on Iran. Uh, Dr. Puya Azadi, who's managing that program, is here. Next week, we'll have a talk by Dr. Madani, arguably the best expert on water in Iran, who's going to talk about the problems of water. We also have, with the medical school, uh, with the lab that Professor Parvizi runs, a joint program. We have already done one talk right here about where primates get their morality from and whether you need a moral system from, whether you need religion, whether you need laws uh, to have a moral system, or whether evolutionary psychology can tell us where some of the moral values come from. We're soon going to put that online. It's intended to be uh, for uh, Iran, we have a neuroscientist working at Dr. Parvizi's lab precisely for uh, inquiring into what neuroscience tells us about science, about truth, about morality. Uh, so with the Festival of Iranian Arts, with this program, uh, with Iran uh, Vision 2040, uh, we have a rather interesting uh, set of events. Um, the conference that, again, Dean Saller referred to was really a remarkable conference. Aloy Abtekar, uh, my colleague, a dear friend who is here now, helped curate this. Iranian Studies was one of the major, the major sponsor of this. It began with a live streaming from a coffee house in Tehran of a Naqali, and it ended with a brilliant scholarly paper on the origins of passion play by Bahram Abezai. Uh, and that combination is a rather unusual combination. And the only person whose uh, view of the world is almost as varied as the description that I have given you is Shah Nusha Parsipur. Uh, and I will tell you a little bit about uh, Shah Nush. As you know, uh, a copy of uh, one of her books uh, has, uh, th that she kindly has signed is uh, there for you to uh, take as a gift for us. Uh, we also, on our website, uh, put a link to an article that I wrote many years ago. I wrote an introduction to one of her books, uh, The Blue Logos, and then translated that. It's in English, and it's available there. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to repeat it, but I'm going to say a few words uh, about Shah Nusha Parsipur. Uh, I have had the good fortune of knowing uh, Shah Nush for almost 30 years. I remember very well the first time I saw her. 
It was at the house of a friend, uh, the friend who went on to write Reading Lolita in Tehran, and she had invited Shahnoush Parsipur. She had already published a best-selling novel and was the star of the literally scene in Tehran, and she walked out of her car, this radiant, brilliant young woman, 30 years younger than today. Uh, and that radiance, and that charisma, that curiosity, that humanity, that humility has been with her for the last 30 years that I have had the good fortune uh, of knowing her. She was, in her own words, conceived in the same month as the atomic explosions in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I think she might well be the only writer in the world who has given her, not her birthday, but the moment that she was conceived, and then counterposes it to Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki. She comes from a family of poor aristocrats. From the name aristocracy, they just had the title, but they were also, as she describes brilliantly, uh, poor. It was a family filled with eccentrics, uh, and she has written about some of these eccentric characters in some of her uh, novels. She began writing very early in life, but she also maintained an avid interest in a couple of other fields. She has been an interested follower of philosophy. She has been avidly reading about the occult. The first time she saw me, she said, are you a rat? And I said, I beg your pardon? She said, I think you were born in the year of the rat. And uh, I still don't know whether I am or not, but I'm sure she knows. And she knows every other sign about every other. Uh, she has translated a book on I Ching into Persian. Her interest, of course, extends far beyond Persian literature or Eastern philosophy. She is as interested in Stephen Hawkins and his theory of times as T.S. Eliot's Ash Wednesday, uh, much of which appears in one of her novels. For a while, she was married to Nasser Tavoyi, an acclaimed filmmaker. Uh, the, the result of that marriage is a son who is now in Australia uh, with his new bride. Her breakout novel, uh, Dog and the Long Winter, is about a woman smothered by tradition. She has come back from the dead to tell us about her travail. Dr. Ferishte uh, Dovaran, uh, a critic, and now a friend of Ms. Parsipur, and as she described her to Ms. Parhat, also the mother of my son, uh, wrote an influential review of the novel, arguing that, it is, that its feminism was far more informed and assertive than what was then the iconic feminist novel of the time, Simine Behbahani's Subashun. Her most famous novel, Tuba and the Meaning of the Night, is an apt metaphor for her creativity and her curiosity. We will see a film made by Shirin Nishat, inspired by the book. Tuba is a tree in paradise where our phoenix, or Seymour, perches. Another of her masterpieces is Woman Without Men. That too was turned into a film by Shirin Nishat. We will also be showing you clips from the film and also the part where uh, she plays a small role. She plays a madam in a, a house of uh, ill repute, as Shakespeare would call it. Uh, as you know, Shirin Nishat is one of the most acclaimed and successful artists of Iranian diaspora, of, I, I, I suspect, anywhere in the world today. Her photographs, video installations, and films have won many awards. Last year, the Iranian Studies was uh, involved as a junior partner with Cantor Museum when they sponsored an exhibit of women photographers from the Middle East. Shirin Nishat and her uh, photography was the centerpiece of that exhibit. Uh, her first feature film was based on uh, Shahnoush Parsipur's Woman Without Men. In uh, Nishat's words, it took six years to make, and it was simply a labor of love. It won the Silver Lion Award at the Venice Film Festival. Once the film, when the film initially came out, we showed it here at Stanford as a part of the Iranian Studies program, and on that occasion, both Shirin Nishat and Shahnoush Parsipur were here and participated. Uh, 
She really in a shot, I want to thank her because she generously allowed us to use her films here and asked me to send her best wishes to Shahnusha Parsipur. Please join me in watching two film clips, one based on Tuba and the meaning of the night, the other one clips from a, a longer film that uh, Professor Bezai says is a very important film and you should all watch, The Woman Without Man. Thank you. مردم تهران بر ضد تحریم کشتی های ایران توسط دولت انگلستان روز به روز در حال افزایش است پامیشی وسایل شما جور میکنی اخونه بری بیرون پاتو قلم میکنن زری مشتری اومده این حق منه که برم یه زن دیگه بگیرم پس بهتر سرکار خانوم دیگه بسه انگار اون چه که همه ما در جست و جوش بودیم یافتن شکلی تازه راهی جدید به سوی رهایی بود Good evening and welcome. With your permission, I would like to say a few words in Persian and then I'll continue my talk in English. خانم ها و آقایان و دوستان عزیز، به نهمین مراسم جایزه ادب بیتا در دانشگاه استنفورد خوش آمدید. قبل از هر چیز میخوام از این فرصت استفاده کنم و برای یکی از برندگان پیشین این جایزه، یعنی استاد شجریان، آرزوی سلامتی و تندرستی کنم. فکر میکنم در این آرزو همه شما بیش و کم همه ملت ایران دوستان موسیقی در سراسر جهان با من همدل و همصدا هستند بسیاری از ما به یاد داریم که چطور در روزی که این جایزه را دریافت کرد به رقم سرماخوردگی چند بیتی به صدای زیبای منحصر به فردش خواند و همه هزار را مدیون لطف و هنر خود کرد گروه ایران شناسی دانشگاه استنفورد ده سال پیش با حمایت حمید و کریستینا مقدم شروع به کار کرد. کمک های من به دانشگاه این فرصت را ایجاد کرد که نه تنها این جایزه هر سال به هنرمند یا محقق برجسته اهدا شود، بلکه کلاس هایی در زمینه زبان و شعر و سینما و تئاتر فارسی هم به استادی کسانی چون جناب بهرام بهیزایی ارائه شود. موفقیت این برنامه که امروز قاعدتا به مهمترین مرکز ایران شناسی امریکا تبدیل شده مدیون آقای دکتر میلانی هست که تجسم شرافت و کوشندگی است و به لحاظ مدیریت و دانش و کاردانی و پیشگیری او ایران شناسی در استنفورد توانسته به رونق کنونیش برسد. از سمیم قلب از او تشکر می کنم. در این حال میخوام از دکتر ریچارد سلر هم تشکر کنم که همواره از حامیان جدی گسترش مطالعات مربوط به ایران در دانشگاه استنفورد بوده. اگر به اسامی برندگان این جایزه در هشت سال اخیر نگاه کنید، به نظرم قبول میکنید که هر یک از آنها دستاوردهای بزرگ در رشته کار خود داشتند. کیست که سیمین بهبهانی را شیرزن شعر معاصر نداند؟ 
یا شجریان را برجسته ترین صدای آواز عصر خود نخواند. آیا کسی هست که به بهرام بیزایی, بهرام بیزایی را مهمترین و خلاقترین نمایش نویس ایران نشمارد یا احسان یارشاتر را به عنوان معمار بنای عظیم ایرانیکا قدر نشناسد؟ در این مجموعه ستارگان فکر و ادب ایران مهمان عزیز امشب ما خانم شهرنوش پارسیپور جایگاه بلندی دارد. از چند دهه بیش در راه خلق قصه های گویا و زیبا گام زده. آزادی قلم و برابری زنان همیشه محور و ستون آثارش بوده. نه سالها زندان و نه تلخی طبعی در ازمش برای خلق آثاری تازه خلالی ایجاد نکرده. ذهنش دائم در جستجوست، قلمش پیوسته مشغول است و همه ما ایرانیان و تمام کسانی که از این طریق ترجمه آثارش را میخوانند بهرهور این آثار و این کوشش حماسی در راه حقوق زنان هستیم. ممکن است زنان بدون مردان بتوانند در باقی خوش بگذرانند، اما ایران بدون شهرنوش پارسیپور ادبی محدودتر می داشت. از طرف خودم و همه ایرانیان از او به خاطر تمام تلاشاش سپاس گذارم. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and family, welcome to the ninth annual Beta Prize celebration. Before I say a few words about our award recipient tonight, and before I thank Dr. Dean Saller for his consistent support of Iranian studies at Stanford, I want to offer my best wishes to a past Beta Prize recipient. I think I speak, to, I speak for virtually every Iranian and for music lovers around the world when I say our best wishes are with Maestro Shajarian, who in his own words is now fighting an invited guest who has invaded his body. Some of you remember how when he received the Beta Prize, in spite of suffering from a cold, he graced our evening with his heavenly sound. The Iranian Studies program established with the visionary support of Hamid and Christina Mogaddam is almost 10 years old. My endowment helped the program expand its offering in Persian culture and language. If in less than a decade the program has become the preeminent center for an interdisciplinary study of modern Iran, it is to no small measure because of the support of Dean Saller. Before he came to uh, Stanford for, uh, from University of Chicago, where he was a provost, Stanford was sadly missing programs for the study of Iran, Islam, and Asia. Under his leadership and support, Stanford has taken giant strides to fill this vacuum. His support for the Iranian studies, evident amongst other things in his presence here tonight, and at virtually all of our past celebrations, is one example of his visionary leadership. Thank you, Dean Seller. I would like to also thank Dr. Milani, who is an icon of integrity and hard work for his leadership, knowledge, guidance, and perseverance in managing and growing the Iranian studies program here at Stanford. The success of this program is due to you and all your heartfelt efforts. Thank you, Dr. Milani. I also want to offer a hearty welcome to Roma Parhat, who has capably taken over as the program manager for the Iranian studies a year ago and has been simply marvelous in her efficiency, cordiality, and ability to manage a growing and multifaceted program. She is helped in her tireless efforts by Mr. Franco Errico, a welcome addition to our program. Finally, I would like to thank each and every one of you who are here tonight, our wonderful community, who have eagerly and steadfastly supported our program by attending our events. In the last four weeks, almost 3,000 members have attended plays, conferences, performances, lectures organized by our program at Stanford. Thank you. When we look back at the list of our last eight winners, they are a virtual who's who of Iranian art, culture, and scholarship. I already mentioned uh, Maestro Shajarian. 
Our first winner, Simin Behbahani, was deservedly called the Lioness of Iran, and her passing was mourned not just by a nation in Iran, but by the international community. Our last year's winner, Professor Yarshader, uh, embodies a life dedicated to scholarship on Iran. Even in this pantheon of greatness, Shahnoush Parsipur stands as a woman who has dedicated her life to literature, to giving voice to the suppressed voices of Iranian women, and to defending the right of artists to create freely. She has paid heavily for her talent and dedication. Long years of imprisonment, banishment, and drudgeries of exile have done little to dampen her enthusiasm to create, to speak truth to a world dominated by men, and offer us a ray of hope in her endless resilience. It gives me a great pleasure to give this year's Beta Prize to Shahnoush Parsipur, whose novels and stories uh, inspire generations around the world. Please welcome Shahnoush Parsipur to the stage. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a real honor for me to be chosen for the prestigious Beta Prize. 22 years ago, I came to the United States as a political refugee. The last thing that I wanted in my life was the statue of a political refugee. I was not a political activist. I was simply a writer, but I was sent to prison three times during the years of the Islamic Republic of Iran. One of these times, I spent more than four years and seven months in prison. No indictment was ever issued for me. By the end of my prison, I was really tired. I could not work in Iran. My books were banned, and I had no other source of income. So I came to the United States. Here I am always with Iranians. Since my arrival here in America, I have written seven books. They include novels and memoirs. They are all in Persian. So while I am not in Iran, I have a very real Iranian lifestyle. From here, when I look at Iran and the other countries in the Middle East, I worry. There is always war and conflict. There it is today, a nasty part of the world. Those countries were once the center of the old continents, but today they are always involved in conflict and war. Phenomena like Daesh, ISIS, or Taliban makes me sick. As an Iranian, I grew up in a Muslim family and I had good feelings about Islam. My father prayed, but at the same time, he drank alcohol, loved to dance, and loved to listen to music. My mother, who began to pray only at the age of 15, also loved Hollywood. The people of Iran, like most people around the world, were normal men and women. But then suddenly, after 1,400 years, Islam became political. They tried hard to imprison women in their homes and have executed repeatedly innocent people. In reality, I like to be a Muslim because my family is Muslim. Of course, I do not pray, and it is not a strange thing not to pray in traditional Islamic way of life. We have a very great way of thinking. About this thing, I am talking about Iranian Sufism. You can find famous people in this school. Rumi is one of them. In his books, he always speaks, speaks about Islam. He has nothing against this religion. But, this, but his books have an international flavor and influence. Another name I can mention is Attar. In his Conference of Bears, his way of looking 
and the world is also international. They are all Muslims. But unfortunately, at this historical moment, Islam is a phenomena, phenomenon that Daesh ISIS finds its roots in. Muslims have found a bad reputation around the world. And I see that a lot of interesting traditions are ruined because of the greed of the game of politics. I look at Yemen and I worry. I look at Iraq and worry. I look at Syria and begin to cry. I look at Afghanistan and I worry. In Iran, they execute one person every day. Unfortunately, I know the situation of the Middle Eastern countries will only get worse in near future. In short, while I am not politically happy, but from the point of view of personal life, I find myself happy. Here I live in an apartment and I share my neighborhood with African Americans. I see them every day at YMC at 5.30 in the morning. They are the wonderful men and women. I live with the people from Vietnam and Cambodia. I have a lot of Chinese friends, and I am sorry that I do not speak Spanish to talk with my Latin American neighbors. This is America. I love this type of life, to be among the people of the world. Thank you. Thank you. My life as a writer had a lot of ups and downs. I wrote my first novel at the time of the Shah. In those days, too, we had problems with censorship. In that novel, I wanted to speak about the situation of the leftists. But speaking about these groups was prohibited. So my novel found a surrealistic plot. It was impossible to write in a realistic form. The book was divided in two parts. The beginning was realistic, the second part surrealistic. But nevertheless, they arrested me for some vague reason. I had typed three copies of my book, and they confiscated all copies that were with me. Fortunately, a copy was in the hand of a friend. Eventually, the book was published, but though very popular with readers, it never saw a second print. It was in the blacklist. I was not a political activist, but I knew that unless we could solve the problem of the left, we could not have a natural life in the Eon. Eon was the neighbor of Soviet Union, and leftist groups had very strong following in the country. They were barred from having a party or an organization. They worked in secret, and the situation was very delicate. I went to France and I tried to learn Chinese language and philosophy. I was in France when my first novel published in Iran. I wrote the second book. Its name is The Simple and Small Adventures of the Esprit of the Tree. This one was in a way the continuation of the first novel. In France I was more free and I wrote without worrying about censorship. But the book finished when the Islamic Revolution began. I did not publish the second novel because it had criticism of the leftists. They were already under attack in the country. Then I finished the stories of women without men, publishing them, without publishing them. I wrote my novel, Tuba and the Meaning of Night, in prison. I had finished half of the book when suddenly prison guards confiscated it. After a year, they gave it back to me. Some pages were missing. I burned the manuscript because it is not good to write under the horrible situation of the prison. After four years and seven months, I was set free without charges ever filed against me. I back to the society without any money or a job. I opened a bookstore, and after six months, I closed it. During this, during this six months, I rewrote Two Boy in the Meaning of Night. The book hit the market one week after the death of Ayatollah Khomeini, 
and it found a huge success. I then decided to publish Women Without Men, but then they arrested me again. They told me the book is against Islam and they confiscated it and banned two by the meaning of night too. These are moments in my literary career full of stress and problems. In the United States, I have written several books. I sent each to Sweden and Baron Publishing House, publishes them. It sends some copies here and there, and I never know what is the opinion of the people about my books. So I am a lonely writer. I have very few contact with the people of Iran. My books are still banned in Iran. Now, at the age of 70, I have an idea to write a new book about an old woman who was a goddess when she was young 10,000 years ago. I like to work at the concept of femininity of the humanity. I wish to work on this idea, and I hope life permits me to write it. But I am sure even after writing this book, I will be alone. Loneliness is my destiny. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.